Hebrews chapter 12. Let's just begin here. Praise the Lord. Um, I know that there is purpose behind this. I'm still trying to process the purpose because I believe that we're about to see the activities of heaven among us like we've never seen before. The Lord began to deal with me early in this week about the ministry of angels. And I have been caught up in it. I mean, literally caught up in it. And I'm seeing some things that I have never really seen in the light that I'm seeing them. And what God is trying to get across to us. Um, I read an article, and I don't know um, what issue it was, but I read an article online where the Lord spoke through a very prominent minister and said that the Lord told them that in these last days that there were going to be new assignments given to angels to bring in and usher in the coming of the Lord. And there are things that I believe that are on the horizon. I don't know how soon the Lord's going to return. I, I just know that there's so much prophecy that has been fulfilled that we are literally standing on the edge of the change of an age. And I know that there are scriptures that still need to be fulfilled, particularly things that have been spoken over the church. Um, but I know that God said that he was going to do a quick work in righteousness. And as you know well, as well as I do, righteousness has to do with our position and how God wants to use the church in these last days to get things done. And um, how quick a work it's going to be, I don't know. But I can tell you that if we start seeing the move of angels like I know that God wants to move, uh, things will begin to accelerate. The, the, the level of expectancy and the level of confidence that will rise in the church will be exponential. Yeah. Because the church will begin to realize we have helpers mm -hmm. to get this job Amen. done. Amen. And whatever the enemy's plans are to try to thwart what God wants to do in these last days, we're going to see the hand of God move and the church is going to take on a boldness that she's probably not seen since the early days. When, and I'm just going to say this because I'm, I'm going to get to Hebrews. But when Daniel was in captivity in Babylon, um, he began to read through the writings of Jeremiah and he saw where God had spoken through the prophet that Israel was going to go through a season of captivity for 70 years because of their disobedience and not honoring the Sabbath every seven years. They did that for 490 years. And so there was 70 years upon them that had to be honored as being a Sabbath. That's why they, there was the lamb was laid rest for 70 years. And Israel was in captivity and the season had come now for that fulfillment. And Daniel was beginning to realize that the, the, the time of their release was at hand. And so he began to pray. So what God did, let me just explain this to you, because this is so powerful that God began to put this in his heart. And he began to seek the Lord because it was a transitional period. God, God was, had taken them out of their land, put them in a foreign land, which was Babylon. They were there for 70 years, and now it was transition for them to go back to their land. They had fulfilled what God said concerning them having to give the land rest for 70 years, and so he was going to restore back to them their land. He raised up the Medes and the Persians to conquer Babylon. So there was a transition of government going on in the world 
between Babylon and the Medes and the Persians. And of course, we all know about Cyrus, how Cyrus was, was given a, a, uh, the charge to give Israel back their land and to let them go back. And when Daniel was praying about all of this, and he, I'm sure Daniel probably even read it where God was promising through Isaiah about Cyrus coming and delivering them. And um, so in his intent prayer and fasting and seeking the Lord, the Bible tells us that the angel Gabriel came to him. Amen. And you can read this in Daniel chapter 9 and chapter 10, this whole experience where Gabriel uh, came after 21 days. And he told Daniel, he said, Daniel, I was sent from the very first day that you prayed to bring answer to you concerning the nation. And he said, but the prince of Persia withstood me. In other words, there was demonic activity going on in the world to try to stop what God was doing. And this is what's so amazing is that Gabriel said that he sought help and God sent Michael, the archangel, to fight for him in the heavenlies to give passage so that Gabriel could get to Daniel. Yes, 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 yes. And when you study this whole thing, what, what, you're, what you're seeing is how that angels have power to move things in the realm of the spirit if we will stay connected in the realm of the spirit and praying for what God wants done. Amen. The Bible tells us that the, that the Lord has given angels charge over us. That's their job. They have been given charge. That's a commandment of God to watch over us and to keep us in all of our ways. He said, even if you were to Stumble, he said, that the angels would protect you from even dashing your foot against a stone. There are a lot of things that go on that we probably don't even realize that there's been angelic assistance. I remember a particular incident. Betty and I, we pastored in middle Georgia many years ago. And my mother was still alive at that time, and she was living in Jacksonville. And so we, we made a trip down to visit, and uh, we were on our way back home. And we were coming back up US-1, going toward Douglas. And um, we're talking, just enjoying the trip, not paying much attention. It's getting close to the evening, you know. I mean, it's still light, but not like in the day. And uh, starting to, you know, uh, sun was going down. and. Right in the middle of the road. I mean, I'm just riding down the road and didn't see anything until all of a sudden, right in the middle of the road, is this real tall dog. I mean, he was huge. He was probably this tall. <coughs> and um, I didn't think about it. It was almost reflex, involuntary. I grabbed the steering wheel and I turned to miss the dog. Because, I mean, I would have probably messed the car up quite a bit. He was big. And when I turned, I went off into the side, into the grass. And it was one of those uh, medians that went down like into a ditch. And in the middle of the ditch was this long railing. It had a concrete post at every, you know, eight feet or so. And then the railing on each side of it. And when I hit the grass, the whole end of the car began to shift. And I started sliding. I had no control of the vehicle. And I knew that I, this driver, was heading right toward that post where my door was. I, I mean, I'm fixing to hit this at 50 miles an hour. It's going to wrap around that post. And no telling what kind of damage would have been done to us. Well, while I'm sliding, trying to figure out in my mind how to get back up on the road, Betty hollers out, Jesus! And God is my witness, and she can verify this. When she hollered out the name of Jesus, I mean instantaneously, my car 
was up on the highway and I'm going down the road as if I had never been off of it. And we're riding down the road and we're looking at each other in amazement saying, how did that happen? Because in the natural, there was no way for my car to gain traction, to be thrown back up on the highway without me wiggling back and forth and for everything to come to such a stillness like a peace was in that vehicle. And I know it was angels. I know that there were those that were encamped around about us that were watching us. And when she declared the name of Jesus, something took place supernaturally to assist us in ways that we couldn't assist ourselves. Now, the Bible tells us in Hebrews 1, and we'll get to that, that they are all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who are heirs of salvation. The Bible makes it clear that we are saved. We have been called and we have been saved. For by grace are you saved. And it also tells us that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. So heirs of salvation obviously applies to those of us who are believers. The moment you gave your life to God, you were saved. You're being saved. You're going to be saved. But right now you are saved. And there is an inheritance that's been given to us. And God said that the angels are ministering spirits sent for those who are heirs of salvation. Now, here in Hebrews, we know, according to this, <coughs> that in the Old Testament, beginning in verse 18, those that were under the law, those that came up under Moses, it said that they came to a mount that was touched and that burned with fire, he said here uh, that was had blackness and darkness and tempest. And it says, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the, that the word should not be spoken to them anymore, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it should be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible is the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. So here's God speaking to them from a literal mountain. Thank you. From a literal mountain, Mount Sinai. Okay? And what did, what did it say? It says, and there was a voice. There was a voice that was speaking to them out of that mountain. But then it begins in verse 22 and says, but ye speaking about the church, are coming to Mount Zion under the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and notice this, and to an innumerable company of angels. An innumerable company of angels. Innumerable literally meaning you can number them. There are so many angels, you can't number them. Glory. Now, think about that for a moment. Here we are, we're, 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 we're the church now, and we have come to a totally different kind of mountain. Not one that burns with, you know, fire and blackness and darkness and tempest, he said, but a mountain that is spiritual. He says it's the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and the spirits of just men made perfect. Notice this. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Now watch this. Verse 25. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. Now, Israel stood before the Mount Sinai and heard God speak to them. And they so exceedingly feared and quaked over it that they wouldn't, even, they wouldn't even touch it. They wouldn't even get up to it. They were afraid. They didn't even want to hear God's voice because it was so strong. 
But now we've come into another mountain where God is talking. He's speaking. He said here, see that you refuse not him that speaketh. Do we hear him with the natural eye? Or I mean with the natural ear? Do we hear him with our natural ear? No. How does he speak to us? Let's go back to the first chapter. In verse 1, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. There is something going on inside of us where God is talking. Amen. God is speaking by his Spirit through his Son to us. And we have to be sensitive to hear what the Spirit is saying. Amen. Jesus himself said, he said, he that hath ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And the Spirit only speaks what he hears. Amen. And what he hears is what is being instructed to him through the Lord Jesus Christ to the church. who is He's the head of the church. Are you listening to me? Amen. And if you go over into the book of Revelations, the very first couple of chapters, Jesus gives John instruction to write seven letters to the churches of Asia. And, and in the very first church he speaks to, he talks about how in Ephesus, he said Jesus was the one who held the pastors or the uh, angels in his hand. And he walked up and down in the midst of the golden candlesticks, which was the seven churches. So Jesus, the Spirit of the Lord, is in the church. Yes. He's walking up and down in the midst of the church. And he's, he's, he's instructing the church by His Spirit. Are you listening to me? Yes. Now, what we need to understand is that the, in, the, in the New Testament, now people, you know, I, 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 I just don't understand how people have a d difficult time understanding the ministry of angels today because, I mean, they were all throughout the early church, all in the ministry of Jesus, all in the, in the early church. There's 186 biblical uses of the word angels in the New Testament, 55 in the book of Revelation. So when we're talking about angels, we're not just talking about them in the early church because they're going to be here during the tribulation period. They're going to be working on the earth during the tribulation period. So why would it be so hard for us to believe that the angels of God were very, very active and operative in the early church and that they're going to still be here operating on the earth during the tribulation? Why would we think between the early church and the tribulation, they just quit and that they're not active anymore? No, they're here. You may not see them, but they are here. I just read a story recently of a missionary in Burma <clears throat> where he had uh, run out of medical supplies in his mission and he was going to have to go into an area that was very, very treacherous, dangerous. Robbers, thieves, um, people that had no respect for life were going to be uh, in that area that he had to go through to get to the supplies. So he kind of felt in his heart, you know, the fear of going through this place because he felt like he'd probably run into some of these uh, along this particular path. And so he, you know, prayed. And he, of course, went in faith. And uh, as he's going through this path, he said, all of a sudden, out of just nowhere, he said, all of these guerrillas just came out with guns and soldiers, you know, that had guns and, and, and all. And um, they stopped him. <laughs> And immediately, he thought that they were going to take his life or take everything he had, rob him. And the leader that was among them said, we've come to assist you. Well, it was mind-boggling to him because they were not the kind that would do that. And so he went, got his supplies, and on his way back, they were escorting him back to his mission. And he stopped, you know, along the way and asked one of the guys, he said, why is it that you're helping me? Because this is so unusual that you're helping me. 
And one of them said, when we saw you coming down the path, he said, we knew that you must be somebody important because you had 26 men that were with you that were fully armed and stood at seven or eight feet tall. And so he knew that God had sent his angels to protect his life. And so he was going to report back to his ministry in the United States of the incident. And when he did, the people that were in the church began to look at the time frame of when this all happened and found out that the very day that he was going through this, they had called a prayer meeting for him because God had put it in their heart to pray for their missions. And they prayed for this man. And it said in this article that the 26 men that were walking alongside of him that were the angels, that the report came back that 26 men were in that prayer room praying for him. Wow. So while, while, while they're praying, not even realizing what's going on, God is doing something in another part of the world that they couldn't see and was carrying it out through the work of, in the ministry of angels. I, I, I just can't tell you the different times that things have happened supernaturally. I'm sure every one of us could give testimony of things that we look back on and it, it, it makes zero sense to us why things happened the way they did. But we know that God intervened. Somehow we know God intervened. Yes. And, and I, I want to uh, go back here for just a moment because there's some other things tied into this that I think are so vital for us to get. We've talked about this many times, but if you have your Bible, you can go back to Genesis 1. <clears throat> when God created the earth, and he decided that he wanted to put man on this earth. Genesis 1.26 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that, that moveth on the earth. Now, what you have to understand is, and this is so important that we get, we have no idea we, we really don't. God didn't give us instruction in His Word concerning this so that we can't date it, but we have no idea how many eons of time occurred before God did what He did in Genesis. All we know is that God is eternal and that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, what makes up what we call the Godhead, existed from eternity past. When, when, I mean, and our minds can't fathom that. That God's always been. No beginning. And so, what we do know is that God created angels. They are created beings. When God created them, we have no idea. They could have been here for billions of years before creation ever came about in Genesis 1. All we know is that we have the Godhead and then we have angels. And there is a hierarchy. I said there's a hierarchy. I'm not sure that any of us really know the rank and file of all of those angels. I do know that according to Isaiah 6, the seraphims had six wings. And according to Ezekiel's vision on the river of Chabar, that he saw cherubims that had four wings. So there are seraphims, they have six wings. There is cherubims that have four wings. And then we have what was also called archangel. 
The only mention of an archangel in the New Testament is Michael, but some believe that Gabriel, Michael, and even possibly Lucifer before he fell could have qualified as archangels. Underneath that, we have other ranking angels. We have principalities, we have powers, we have thrones, we have dominions, we have virtues. All of those are described as angels in the, in the scriptures. Some are called burning ones. There are scriptures that, that we see them in operation to where some of them are warring angels. Some of them have uh, assignments that are given to us to watch over us. Jesus talked about how the, the little ones don't despise the little ones because their angel specifically spoke of them as having their angel beholding the face of the Father in heaven. So, uh, obviously, we have angels. I don't know if you think about this. I don't know if it ever ponders in your mind that everywhere you go, that angel's with you. He stands guard over you at night while you're sleeping. He's riding in your vehicle while you're riding down the road. He probably sits and watches you when you eat your food. Think about that. He's assigned to you. God gave him charge over you. That's the, that's the scripture. Now, how many of them we have assigned to us individually, I have no idea. There may be, based on destiny, more than just one. There may be a multitude I do know this, that when Jesus was in the garden and they came to take him, that he told them, he said, if I desired it, I could pray to the Father right now. And he could send 12 legions of angels to stop you from taking me. Now, according to history, a legion was over 6,000 soldiers. So if Think about that. In fact, I think one reference said 6,826 angels. I mean, uh, soldiers. So if Jesus said 12 legion, you take 6,826 and you multiply it by 12, that's over 82,000. Now, why would you need 82,000 to rescue you from those that were coming to you in the garden? I don't think it would have taken one to do what needed to be done. But Jesus was making the point. I have a myriad of angels that can come to assist me if need be. But he said after that, he said, but because it would keep scripture from being fulfilled, I'm not going to do that. So he carried out his assignment. Now, mm, this is good. God said that he made man to have dominion. Now go to Psalms chapter 8. I know where I'm going, so I'm about to bust a gasket. Golly, dog. If God isn't awesome, awesome I don't know what to say. But now here's David, he's praying, and of course he's looking at the heavens. The, he says in verse 3, When I consider the heavens, the work of thy finger, the moon, the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Verse 5, For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the work of thy hands. Thou put all things under his feet. All sheep, oxen, yea, the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, whatever passeth through the sea, uh, uh, the paths of the sea. In other words, God said, I, I, I put man over everything on earth. Everything. But now here's the part you've got to see. A couple of things. But first of all, look at verse 5. He says, Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Now that's how it reads in Hebrews 2. We'll maybe get to that. But actually, this is a mistranslation. Because the word angels is not actually the word that's being used here in the Hebrew. You go back and study this. 
The word for angels in the Hebrew is Elohim. And of course, those of you that are students of the word, you know that El represents God, Jehovah God, El. But Elohim is the plural use of El. Meaning that we're not just talking about God the Father, but we're also talking about God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, the Godhead. So when we read this, the King James would, write, would say, For thou hast made him a little lower than the Godhead. The original Hebrew says, Thou renderest him a little short of God. That's the Hebrew, original Hebrew. Thou renderest him a little short of God. The cross-reference translation says, Thou hast caused man to stand but a little behind God. Now, you've got to understand something about this. God made us in His image after His likeness. And in the truest sense of the word, the fact that we are so much like God, it's as if we are God's. Okay? And I can take you through some scriptures and show you how that even the scripture says, ye are God's. Jesus spoke about it in John 10. Amen. But now, what's the difference? What's the difference? Now listen very carefully. God made us so much like Himself that we're just a little behind Him. And where we're a little behind God in creation is that God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth He under any man with evil. And you and I can be tempted. Adam was tempted. So where there's a little bit of a shift in our abilities as opposed to God's abilities is God cannot sin. He cannot do evil. He cannot fall. He is God Almighty. Amen. But He created us like Him in every sense of the word except that part of us. That we have a will and we can misappropriate that will and do something that's not right. Adam had that right. God gave it to him. He chose to do wrong. But Jesus came, who is the express image of God's person. He is the image of God. He came, and he took upon himself flesh, just like you and I have flesh. And he, by the grace of God, took upon a body that could be tempted. Now, the God side in him could never fall. That's why the Bible says that he was without sin. Amen. No guile was in his mouth. Amen. So, so he was the merging of the God side that could not sin and the man side that could sin. And he, in the middle of that, lived his life on this earth to take our place in humanity and live it without sin. Not only to redeem us from sin, but to enable us to overcome sin. We're not just delivered from sin. Listen to me. We are delivered from it to where if we'll live out of our spirit, we can live above it. We can live above it. And this is where angels begin to come in. The Lord began to show it to me. He said, you are, a, you are a human vessel that can be tempted. But I have caused angels to be encamped around about you. So that when the enemy does come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. So that you can be protected against the enemy so that you will not fall, Amen. so that you will not slip. Amen. He'll keep you in all your ways. Yes. Yes. The angels yes. Yes. that are encamped around about you will keep you in all of your ways. 
But you've got to honor their work. Yes. You've got to give honor to where honors do. You've got to recognize that there are, there are things that have been given to you as an assignment and there are angels to help you in your assignment. But they are also there to protect you because there are forces working. I said there's forces working to trip you up, to cause you to stumble and fall. But the angels are there to keep you from stumbling and, and dashing your fo foot even against a stone. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Now, he also says here, not only were we made a little lower than God or a little behind God, crowned with his glory and honor, he said, but thou madest him to have dominion. Now, he said over in Genesis, he said, and let us, and let them have dominion. That was a decree. Let him have dominion. Here, very interesting word. He says, thou madest him. I mean, I made man to have dominion. Amen. That, that's not just a decree. That's a destiny. I made you this way. I, I didn't just say let him have it. I made you yes. to where now it's supposed to be your lot in life to have dominion. Yes. Yes. Well, we know what happened when sin came. Man fell. And we also know that when man fell, that he lost the glory. He lost this honor and glory that God said, Thou hast made him a little lower than Elohim and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Man was wearing the presence of God. He was wearing the honor of God. And he lost that. Romans 3.23, we all know that verse. For all have sinned, right? And done what? Fallen short of the glory. That, that's, that's what happened. When man sinned, he fell short of the glory. In other words, before he sinned, he was right in tandem with that glory. Mm -hmm. He was operating in that glory, mm -hmm. but he lost that because of sin. What was Jesus' whole purpose in coming? The Bible says, He who knew no sin was made to be sin, listen, for us. For us. He became sin, what? For us. So if he became sin for us, then where is sin now? It was put on him and he took it to the grave. He paid the price, the ultimate price of being separated from his father, losing all the glory that he had, being stripped of it to the point where he even cried out on the cross, my God, my God, well hast thou forsaken me. In other words, I'm feeling you leaving me. You have left me. Your presence has left me. He's identifying with what happened in Adam. If he did that, and he paid for it. And he suffered on our behalf to have sin dealt with. Then what's preventing us from the glory? If it was sin that made us fall from the glory and he redeemed us from sin, then what would be standing in the way of us being restored to the glory? Hmm? Go to Romans chapter 5. Man, I, I've got so much to talk about, and I just don't have the time. So after Brother Eddie gets here and he unloads on you, I'm going to come back with a double barrel and load on you some more. But now listen very carefully to this. Romans chapter 3, we just read this, or just quoted it, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, verse 23. Then we get over into chapter 4 and we start talking about Abraham. 
And I think it's very significant. I think it's very significant. That when you get over here into verse 16, it says, Therefore it is a faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. <coughs> he said, Not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written. Now think about this. He's the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. There before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Now, think with me. Think with me. Think with me. Abraham is in his 90s. His wife has been barren all their life as a married couple, hadn't they have any children. God appears to Abram and tells him, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you a son. Now, everything in the natural seemed like this had to be, you know, out of the book of first imaginations. Because how in the world could you have do, could do, you do something like this when not only uh, am, am, as my wife barren, but we're past age. Our bodies have quit functioning from that degree. And God says, no, I'm going to make you a father of a multitude. Now, Abram, of course, as you well know, from right here, he heard that. He heard what God said. And the words here, even God in the Greek, literally means like unto God. Abraham, listen to what we should read. It says, before him, actually before him, I'm sorry, like unto him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. God had to make alive what was dead. I said God had to make alive what was dead. Amen. What, what do you think He did in us when we got born again? Same thing. Amen. Huh? Same thing. He made alive what was dead. That's correct. And how did God do that? According to here, Abraham did what God said. In other words, God called him a father of a multitude when he was childless. And it says here, he called those things which be not as though they were. Yeah. In other words, he's saying what God said when it didn't look like what God said. Are y'all following me? Yeah. And then it turns around and says this, who against hope believed in hope. Against hope believed in hope. Say that with me. Against hope believed in hope. In other words, we, we could just say it this way, simplify it. When all natural hope was screaming at Abraham, telling him, there is no way you can be a father of a multitude. You, have, you don't even have the ability to be a natural father, period. Everything on the inside of him screaming that. But he had the hope of what God spoke. A word that dropped in his spirit because God dropped it in his heart and said, you are going to be a father of a multitude. And the hope of that word was up against the hopelessness of his own body. Now, I want you to follow this thought because you go over into the chapter five when he begins to talk about us as a church. He said, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse two, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice. Look at this. In hope, Hallelujah. we rejoice in what? Hope. In hope. Mm -mm. In hope. Yeah, exactly. In hope of what? Mm -hmm. Of what? Mm -hmm. In hope of the glory of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. The hope. If you go over into Colossians chapter 1, it tells us, in fact, let's just look at that. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but I do want you to see this. In Colossians chapter 1, <coughs> excuse me, in verse 25, 
he picks this man Paul out to be the one who is to bring us this revelation. But he says here in verse 25, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me to you, fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ redeemed us. He is the Redeemer. He's the, the captain of our salvation. Hallelujah. He came and He took upon Himself our sins. He died in our place and He suffered everything that we suffered in Adam. He took it away just like the scapegoat would take it out into the wilderness. He took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Glory to God. And now, because He's done that, there's nothing that stands in the way of the glory of God coming back into our lives through Him. Because by Him occupying a place in our heart now, He has restored to us a hope of the glory. Now, here's the example of Abraham. Abraham in the natural could not even conceive of being a father. But he took what God said, began to declare what God said in the face of everything that opposed what God said and hoped in a hope that was beyond natural hope, a hope of God. And the Bible wants us to understand that the, as children of God, yes, we have these bodies that have not yet been redeemed. We're waiting for the day of these bodies to be redeemed. So we're not experiencing the full manifestation of the glory that Adam experienced in the garden. But God wants us to understand that He has put in our spirit a life that is so full of the glory and the virtue of heaven that now... You and I have the hope of walking in this through faith. Because he says here in verse 2, Romans 5, verse 2, he says that we now, by faith, have access into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We are rejoicing. We are rejoicing. We are rejoicing in the hope that is in us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. We're rejoicing in this. Yes, there's a day coming when we're going to receive glorified bodies. John said it this way. He said, Beloved, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, for when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Every man that hath this hope purifieth himself. In other words, there's something on the inside of us that we know we're going to be like him in every respect. These, these old vile bodies are going to be clothed with His body. Amen. Fashioned like unto His glorious body. Hallelujah. That's what Philippians says. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But now, this is what's so exciting. It says, when He shall appear, we shall see Him as He is. In other words, we're going to see Him in His glorified body. Yes. Yes. Lit up just like He's supposed to be lit up. But then you get over into chapter 4 and verse 17. It says, as he is, so are we in this world. There's a side of us that's already like him. Amen. That's the spiritual side. I don't see the glory from the natural. But there's glory. There's the light of God on the inside of us. We are called children of light. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, you know, this is what's so amazing is that God has assigned angels to help us achieve what God wants us to achieve in this hour. And I truly believe with all of my heart, part of the decree that's being sent out by God to the angels is to get us ready for the coming of the Lord. And Ephesians says... In chapter 5, and I'm just going to read this to you. You can turn there if you like. Romans, I mean Ephesians chapter 5. 
when Jesus is, or, or Paul is instructing us through the Lord to submit ourselves to one another, even wives submit themselves to their husbands, and husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. He goes on down here and he says this in verse 26. He said that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it, the church, to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. The purpose for the glory, listen to me, the purpose for the glory is to prepare you for the coming of the Lord. Amen. There's a work that's going down inside of your spirit right now where the glory of God is washing and renewing and changing you. The Bible even tells us that we're being changed from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. He's changing us. He's changing us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And there is an assignment of angels that are carrying out this decree by God to charge a charge to watch over you Amen. because you're his bride yes. That's good. and he's wanting you to be ready for him when he comes. Yes. He's put inside you everything you need to walk yes. in this walk yes. and he's given you some helpers to get there. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Now, let, now let me, let me just, let me just whet your appetite because I can't go through and, and, and teach you everything that the Lord wants me to teach you today. Hallelujah. Amen. But let me, let, let, and, oh, I wish I could get to that. That's so good. Mm. Yum, yum, but go, go back with me to Psalms 103. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. I'm telling you, I, I'm just saying this. You can take it for what it is. But we're going to see the activity of angels in these last days like we've never seen it before. Amen. It was so common in the book of Acts that when the church prayed for Peter to be delivered and the angel came and broke off those stocks and bands that were on him and led him out of the prison. And opened the gate of the city supernaturally. The Bible says it was opened of its own accord. But it wasn't just opened by its own accord. The angel of God breathed its breath, breath on it. And that thing lifted and moved. Because they're called wind. That's what it is. The spirits are uh, angels are winds. They can blow upon things. And it said that Peter came to Rhoda's house. Knocked on the door. And they came and answered the door. And he said, it's me, it's Peter. And instead of opening the door and letting him in, they ran back to the crowd that was praying and said, it's Peter. Peter's at the door. And you know what they all said? No, nah, it must be his angel. They were more ready to believe an angel had come to the door than Peter himself. Now, how many of us would have thought that? Somebody knocks on your door. Oh, it's just an angel. No, we wouldn't think that. Because we're so removed from that type of thinking. But in the book of Acts, it was common. I mean, you think about all the times that Paul had experiences where angels came and appeared to him. Even on the, on the time that they were on their way to Rome and they had that shipwreck. He said, the angel of the Lord stood beside me tonight. And he said, fear not. I'm going to bring you before Caesar. But now listen to this. Psalms 103, verse 20, it says, Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Notice that. Hearkening unto the voice of his word. Angels do what? They hearken. They do his word. They do his commandments. Whatever he commands, they do. And they hearken. They, they obey. They go out and do whatever is being told them to do when they hear the voice of his word. Now hold your Bible up next to your face. 
How, how many of y'all hear anything? Stop and listen for a second. Is the word talking to you? Are you hearing it? So what in the world does it mean for them to hearken to the voice of his word? God has spoken. This is his word, isn't it? The voice of his word is when we say what God says. When we speak on this earth the word of God, angels hear what we're saying. And if it is a word that God has decreed that shall come to pass, they hearken to that and they begin to move in honor of that word to bring it to pass. Are you listening to me? Now, if God has already told you that he wants you blessed, that he wants you, whatever your hand does, he says he wants it to prosper. If you will take his word and you will begin to decree what he says. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. By his stripes ye were healed. Yes. Yes. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. When you begin to decree what God has already said, you set the angels in motion yes. to begin to move in your behalf. Yes. You say, well, I hadn't seen it come to pass yet. Well, most of that is because we quit with our confession. We don't hold fast to our confession of faith without wavering. Angels, listen to me. The book of, the book of Hebrews begins with talking about how Jesus is greater than the angels. Never did he ever say to the angels, sit at my right hand. Until I make thine enemies thy footstool. He never said to the angels, Thou art my son, and, to, and I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son. Never, he never said that to angels. But guess who he said it to? He said it to the church. He calls us his sons, and he is recognized as our father. He tells us that we have been made to sit at the right hand of God with him. He never said that to angels. Now listen to me very carefully. Angels have been here all this time. All these thousands and thousands of years. And they've been right up underneath God. And all of a sudden God creates a man and plugs him in right between the angels and God. We are over angels. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says we will judge angels. Yes. Not judge them from the standpoint of punishment. But we will judge them as to whether they did their assignment. Whether they were there when we needed them. If we make a decree, if we make a decree based on the word of God, they are bound, yes. duty bound to honor the voice of his word. The confidence level that this is going to bring to us. Yes. When we know that we've got heaven working on our behalf. Yes. That if we need to call 12 legions of angels to come and take care of what we need to have them take care of. That we have their assistance. Yes. Now I want to read this real quick and then I'm going to close. Give me just a second. I wish I could read both of them but we'll get to one of them. Some of y'all already know the story in, in Kings. When Elisha found himself in a situation surrounded by the chariots of the Syrian army. Aren't you? Y'all are familiar with that? Yes. And how he spoke and prayed to the Lord. He said, Lord, my servant can't see right now, so open his eyes. Amen. And he beheld and said that he saw chariots of fire round about. And the use of the word that Elisha had is what I really got excited about because he said, there be more that be with us than be with them. Yes. Their mountain was encamped around about by the Syrian army. And the Spirit of the Lord showed the prophet that there's more that be with us. There's more that be with us. Amen. I said, there's more that be yes. with us. Yes, yes, yes. 
Now, go to 2 Chronicles 32 real quickly. Real quickly. 2 Chronicles 32. This was the time during which King Sennacherib, king of Syria, came, and he entered into Judah. In verse 1 it says, And he camped against the, the fenced cities and thought to win them for himself. Now, uh, back in those days when they would have a siege, uh, sometimes it would last for weeks. Do you remember the story about a, a, a Goliath? And how that the Israelites came up against the Philistines and it said for 40 days they taunted Israel. So, I mean, this was a whole month and a week. They were in, in a place where they were taunting Israel. Well, the same thing was happening here. The Assyrians had decided to, to encamp around about Israel, uh, Judah, and they were going to take them for themselves. And the Bible says here in verse 2, When Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib was come and that he was purposed to fight against Israel, he took counsel with his princes and his mighty men to stop the waters of the fountain which were without the city, and they did help him. In verse 4, So there were gathered much people together who stopped all the fountains and the brooks that ran through the midst of the land, saying, Why should the kings of Assyria come and find much water? In verse 5 it says, And he strengthened himself, he built up all the walls that were broken, he raised up uh, the tower, raised it up to the towers, and another wall without, and repaired Milo in the city of David, and made darts and shields in abundance. In other words, they, they, we're talking about time. Yeah. We're talking about a, a period of time that it took for them to do all these things. So this siege has gone on for a while. Build up walls, build you know, shields and spears and closing up the, the fountain outside and doing some kind of an underground uh, conduit so that the city would have water, but the enemy around them would not have water from that well. Wow. It's taken some time to get this done, isn't it? But all the time that this is happening, the king of Syria, Assyria is making threats. And we can read all through this area <coughs> where he is making these threats. And it says, going on down to, um, let's see. Let's just read in verse 22. It says, And Hezekiah spake comfortably unto all the Levites that taught the good knowledge of the Lord, and did eat through the feast seven days, offering peace offerings and making confession to the Lord God of their fathers. And the whole assembly took counsel. I'm, I'm in 30. What am I doing over here? I'm in, I'm in the wrong place. Sorry about that. All right. I was wondering why I couldn't find that verse. Okay, go down to verse 17. This is 2 Chronicles 32. Sorry about that. It says, He wrote also letters to rail on the Lord God of Israel. This is what uh, 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 the, the, the king of Assyria is doing. He said, I, he wrote letters to rail on the God of Israel and to speak against him, saying, As the God of the nations of other lands have not delivered their people out of my hand, so shall not the God of Hezekiah deliver his people out of my hand. And notice this. It says, they cried with a loud voice, even in the Jews' speech. In other words, they, they weren't speaking Assyrian. They're speaking Hebrew. And making sure that all the people could understand it. And said to the people of Jerusalem that they were on the wall, to, a, to and, and those that were on the wall, to affright them. In other words, to cause more fear to come and to trouble them that they might take the city. Now, what's the devil doing? He's taunting. He's taunting. He's using words to decree over them that he's going to take them and there's nothing they can do. No nation has been able to withstand him. And they're not going to be able to. In verse 7, 19 it says, And they spake against the God of Jerusalem as against the gods of the people of the earth, which were the work of the, man, of, of the hands of man. And it says, And for this cause Hezekiah the king and the prophet Isaiah, think about that. Here's Hezekiah and the people of Israel encamped in this place. And the prophet Isaiah is there. And it says in verse 21, y'all got your shouting clothes on. It says, and the Lord sent an angel which cut.
cut off all the mighty men of valor and the leaders and the captains in the coast of the, of the king of Syria. In other words, I mean, here they are making all these threats, all these decrees over what they're going to do. And right then at that very moment of them crying out to God, the angel, an angel, not many, but one angel comes and in a moment of time just cuts off all the mighty men, all the captains and all the leaders. Everyone that was of significance in that army just falls dead right before their very eyes.